This is the Dane Moore NBA podcast brought to you by Prize Picks. Coming at you early, earlier than normal uh, on Thursday morning. It's March 28th. And that's because we're going to do two shows today, uh, two shows that I'm excited about. Uh, this morning, it's myself and Britt Robson from MinPost. Kind of talk about how the Wolves looked this whole week. Last night, we talked about, you know, Detroit Pistons game wasn't the most exhilarating, but we'll get to some topics from that, I'm sure. And then, yeah, just kind of what's been going on uh, with the Wolves since we had Britt on last week. And then I will have another episode. So that Brit episode is going to come out this afternoon, early afternoon. And then uh, I'll be recording another episode uh, later this evening uh, with the DNVR guys who who covered the Nuggets uh, for the last few years when I've gone out there. It's actually a really fun episode. I really look forward to um, kind of getting outside of just the Wolves, Wolves, Wolves bubble and getting smart people's perspective on the Wolves and, and talking about it. I've always felt like the awkward like cousin or something there where they're like, oh, it's cute, the, you know, the Timberwolves. But now this is fun. This is fun. Uh, Nuggets, Wolves, and a really important game on Friday. So, yeah, we're, we're ramping up, uh, me and Britt today. And then, yeah, you can look for that uh, episode with Adam and Brendan and, and Harrison. That'll be up later this evening. It's where I go on their show, but then I take the audio and put it on, on to my show. But just because I think it is uh, such a good conversation. So that's what's coming uh, coming up today. And yeah, we'll get started. How are you doing, Britt? Good. Where should we start with 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 last night? I'm I was sort of thinking like, you know, what what happened last night that has been um, a a trend of late, an encouraging sign. And I was kind of between like Jade McDaniel's and 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 Kyle Anderson. And I think Kyle came to mind more not to take away from what Jaden's been doing. He's averaging like nearly twenty a game these last four or five games, uh, shooting the ball uh, really well, but. I think to me, as I you know, rewatching uh, the Warriors game and then you're know, watching that game last night, I think a huge part of why this team has not just snapped into competence with with Cat out, but has been a good offensive team is because the Kyle Anderson, Rudy Gobert, whatever spacing issues have really not been present in these ten games that that Cat has been out. Um, what, what about that has, has stood out to you? Then, then, I'll, then I'll go a little bit. Well, I think that playing the four, uh, something you noticed at the beginning of this year, how Slow Mo's uh, career has always, you know, not just with the Timberwolves, but elsewhere, when he plays the three, he's just not as effective. I think some of that has to do with where he's positioned on the floor and who is guarding him. Uh, also, I think that Chris Finch has always unlocked his point guard capabilities. I think he plays much better when he fashions himself as the primary playmaker on the floor, even when he isn't. Sure. Um, and that's even more exaggerated now because of the shooting woes. Uh, he was much more of a catch and shoot threat last year. Uh, so he could play off the ball a lot more. Uh, this year, very reluctant to shoot from three for the good reason that he's not very accurate, but has begun to play make for himself off the bounce. And I think that's also unlocked uh, some of his passing. Uh, he needed to be a scoring threat in some way, shape or form. That wasn't happening earlier in the season. And the fact that he has been able to uh, his his footwork in the paint has been excellent. His shot has always been, you know, from short mid range. He's got good finesse. Um, so all that is running into place. But I also think it's the minutes. It's Cat's abstinence to some extent. It is the fact that there is a lot more spacing, even with Cat out, because a lot of players are extremely hot from three point range right now, including most of the suddenly handful of point guards there are on this team, aside from Slomo, it seems. Uh, so offensively, he has really stepped it up. And uh, that is wonderful because he's such a force on defense that um, when you start to think about, oh, you know, in the playoffs, if you play Slomo, you're going to hurt yourself on offense. And I, I, to be honest with you, I still think that's true in a playoff setting. 
but I also think that uh, what he's doing now and his relationship with Rudy uh, as a you know offensive force and, and what he's doing for the team are all things that have solidified and he's comfortable now and and the team is comfortable with him again and that wasn't the case you know three four weeks ago. So I, I think you left before we we talked to Kyle last night. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Um, so honestly, his his answer to these questions sounded exactly like uh, what what you just said. I think there's there's two elements to this, right? It's the positional shift into Kyle no longer ever playing the three, right? Mm. Uh, now that now that Cat's out, we were talking about you and I were talking about it last night of like the Kyle the four minutes. There's there's Kyle at the four minutes next to Rudy, and then there's Kyle at the four minutes next to Nas. I think he's kind of more the center in, in those in those lineups. Right. But regardless, he's he's not on to the wing. He's playing all of his minutes at the the quote unquote four. He was asked about it uh, after the game last night, so I don't have th- this clip, but I did tweet it out. Uh, he was just asked about you know what has kind of led him to look as as comfortable as he has. He goes. I think Cap being out in just more minutes at the four, I think that's really my natural position. I think I can play the three as well. I think it was, I think I was kind of getting the hang of it before the all star break with Cat in the lineup, but I think it's pretty obvious my best position is the four. But yeah, just a little bit of both of those, his absence and just getting more reps and more time. You know, we, we were asking Kyle about this and Finch about this earlier, you know, in the season. And, and Kyle's answer, you know, at training camp at the beginning of the season, because because I did notice those. Yeah, numbers. no problem. You said. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, he he said they were the the same positionally, right. largely, right. and I don't think he was lying. I, I think he thought he could do the same things he did last season next to Rudy with Cat back while he was the three. You know, and because Kyle that was unrealistic. Over. Yeah, but I I think that's where where his head was. Right, and that, right. that response last night shows me that kind of over the course of the season, he realized, you know, when I do move to the three, um, it's different. It's, it's harder. And what we really saw was the, the spacing issues that kind of came out of those on. you look like you have something you want to say. <laughs> well, just, uh, I think it was wishful thinking, uh, you know, cat wants his place in the paint. Um, in fact, he's been hard to dislodge from that. Even logic says the cat should be shooting eight to ten threes a game, mm-hmm. especially if Rudy is in the dunker spot, because Ant needs to drive and he needs room. Mm-hmm. Um, for Kyle to think, hey, well, I'll just add a third person in that little area. Uh, that's not the modern game at all. And a you know, in addition to the fact that he is primarily a playmaker, he says he thinks like a point guard. Um, but he is a point guard that plays at the nail. Ideally, that's where he gets most of his good decisions from. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't remember. I mean, the the times when he's feeding out of the low post, it's because he's been set up for a nice shot and refuses to take it. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when the offense is flowing the way it should be flowing, he's about 12 feet, 15 feet away from the basket. And so that's hard to do. If uh, you're a three, that's just, uh, you know, that won't work. And so I'm glad that he's acknowledged that um, it does create the issue of, you know, you've got Cat and you've got Rudy and they want to play with skilled bigs. And Nas is also pretty firmly cemented now, uh, rightfully so in the in the rotation. And, and Slomo is a Finch favorite. Uh, one of the things that I think I listed four things to watch for at the beginning of the season, my season preview, and I'm gratified that all of them really turned out. And one of them was a log jam at the, you know, four or five or front court or whatever you want to say. You've got, you know, Cat mm-hmm. and Rudy and Nas and Slomo. And while there's some really cool combinations you can make out of those things, there's also – uh, a little bit of redundancy in some ways, certainly positional redundancy or placement on the court redundancy. If Cat was a stretch four, uh, it would make things a lot easier. But I don't think he is willing, and perhaps rightfully so in some ways, because shots at the rim with him out have gone down. Uh, so anyway, it's just 
there's a little bit too much redundancy, but with Cat out, uh, that has proven to be a nice safety valve as a result. Yeah, well, what, what's interesting about these – you know, 10 games is that this isn't like the first time that Rudy and Kyle have played together without cat, right. you exactly. know, like yep. Kyle yep. was playing a bunch of the four throughout the season before, you know, before towns mm -hmm. got hurt and it wasn't working. Those were actually the most problematic lineups. We talked about that all the time when it was, you know, lineups with Rudy and Kyle on the floor, maybe shake Milton out there with them too. another non-shooter <laughs> Jordan McLaughlin earlier in the year when he wasn't, I mean, that those were, right, right, right. There, there were real issues with the Kyle at the four minutes. So it, it wasn't just as simple as like play Kyle at the four and the offensive problems are going to be solved. Kyle had to start doing something different because he didn't have the three point shot that he had last year. He had the blip of a, 41% three-point shooting season last year. I would agree with that. I would also say that the difference between D'Lo or Conley and Shake Milton was a huge factor there, too. Sure. Uh, if somebody is open behind him, he's pretty good at, you know, that kick out from the nail or mm -hmm. or yeah, actually kind of like a weak side, uh, you know, skip pass or whatever. But would uh, you say the most problematic were like the record scratches when it would just be like, okay, now Kyle caught it in the corner, doesn't want to shoot it, kind of dribbles into a wall absolutely, and absolutely. then has to pass it back out. That, and that one of the things that I have noticed is that hopefully this remains true. It's only been a few games now, but he is no longer stationing himself behind the arc, mm -hmm. which, you know, I mean, it's because it's a useless position. He's been scouted out of that. Nobody will chase him out there. It's not a spacing move. Mm -hmm. uh, He's so been he, now at the top as the point guard or in the dunker. And the top <laughs> actually is a much better place. You can pass off the dribble a lot more comfortably than you can try to pass off the wing or off the corner uh, when you're dribbling in. And he was doing a lot of slot dribbling as opposed to top of the key dribbling. Right. And that slot dribble – even slow-mo was having, you know, he was getting, his turnovers were way up. And so, yeah, I mean, it is, he's such a unique player and he is such a versatile player, but at the same time, some of the pieces have to be aligned for him to really work out. And mm -hmm. so despite his versatility and his distinctive abilities, um, he needs spacing behind him. And he needs a capable lob threat or inside threat um, in front of him. Uh, with that space, he can get his own shot off if he needs to. He can draw defenders as a result. His timing on his passes is excellent. His finesse and touch on his passing. You know, uh, a lot of times we talk about shooter's touch, but passer's touch is a thing, and he's got a great touch with his passing. I, I think just a, a huge factor is confidence for him. And if he has confidence, like he had confidence last season from just shooting the corner three record scratches removed and still doesn't have the confidence in the three. He's not shooting him. I think he's taken like three yeah. or four threes since, since cat's been out uh, for, for 10 games, but he is taking what I noticed is he is taking a lot of mid range shots. He's getting downhill right into a pull up confidently and, and smoothly. I asked him about it at uh at shoot around, um, yesterday or before the Detroit game, and I thought this answer was uh, was was uh, really interesting, and I, I I wasn't respect or wasn't expecting it. Uh, here here's Kyle Anderson. Kyle, um, you've always played from the mid range a lot, but it seems like you've been a lot more like those mid range kind of whoops, yeah, like squared up to the basket. Yeah, I mean, is that a what does that come from? Right now? It just seems like a confidence that you have in your number. Um, you credit to uh, Pablo and T.J. McConnell. Uh, I spoke to TJ McConnell after we played Indiana at home, and uh, he was just letting me know, like, you know, get to the mid-range. You know, I mean? He's watched me since college. He's like, your mid-range has always been deadly. Get to that. It's another, you know, way to make them guard you. Um, and then you can find Rudy. You know, you, you're comfortable inside 15 feet. So I, I give a lot of credit to TJ. He kind of opened that up to me, and, uh, he, and it's been working for me. So I told him when we played them at Indiana, like, you know, thank you, bro. Like, he, he kind of he opened my eyes to it. Just been up top a lot more, like starting at the high quad rather mm -hmm. than the corner, mm -hmm. kind of since the cat injury. What sort of different perspective does that 
Um, I think it, it puts me in a good position to, like I said, get to my mid-range or play make from that 15, 17 foot area. Uh, I was able to find some corner guys because they were so scared of uh, Rudy being a threat under uh, down low. So, uh, you know, I like it. How much does that TJ McConnell thing make sense? <laughs> it makes so much. I would have never thought of it, but it makes so much sense, right? Two right. guys who, who non-shooters right. who need to make it work otherwise. I mean, you wouldn't think of TJ McConnell and Kyle Anderson as similar players necessarily. I was looking up, Britt. There's five players in the league this season who have taken over half their shots from mid-range and under 10% of their shots from three. Five players are Kyle Anderson, TJ McConnell, DeAndre Ayton, Ish Smith, and Bam Adebayo. Super rare. Super rare in today's day and age. And it really is guys who can't shoot the three and have made it work in other ways. You know, like Ayton and Bam, right. that's kind of their centers, right? But you can, you know, if you're if you've watched Kyle Anderson and TJ McConnell play, it's they both, when they're playing well, know how to make that not an issue. And and the way they get offense, individual offense, is is through the the mid range game. Would have never thought about that, but I thought that was an awesome answer. How do they know each other? Did they go to the same college? So, I think they're both in the Pac ten which I think doesn't exist anymore um, okay. at, at the same time when he was at UCLA and TJ was uh, at Arizona mm. and they, we, we asked him a couple other questions uh, about that following up. Cause we're like, Whoa, <laughs> not expecting <laughs> TJ, but God, we were actually John asked him. He's like, Oh, like he asked that same question. He's like, Oh, do you and uh, do you and TJ like go way back? And, uh, and Kyle took the answer. He goes, yeah, man, me and uh, me and TJ uh, TJ Warren have like we grew up together, <laughs> and John was like, "Oh, I didn't like." That's good right. too. That's good information. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so uh, apparently he grew up with TJ Warren, and uh, TJ McConnell has been his guy since uh, college, I think the 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 same age. But uh, yeah, Kyle, huh. Kyle's a great good example of Kyle being uh, a a great quote and uh, like not just in being honest and open like that's just an interesting it's an interesting basketball thing i thought that was really cool yeah and and he there are different types of court iq uh one of the things that i notice is he thinks unconventionally uh kyle will do things like who would have thought that uh the way to make sure you work well with Rudy is to show him and the rest of the people on the floor the ball. I mean, you know, just when he'd hold it up like Don Nelson shooting a free throw, you know, it's like, like on a platter, like a waiter, you know, mm -hmm. and he, he does that waiter move. And all of a sudden he, he just shoots his arm straight up. And uh, all last year, you don't see it nearly as much this year uh, because he's found other methods, but Back when Rudy just really needed to be led by the hand, he was really struggling. Nobody on the team could connect with him, with the possible exception of Cat, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then Slow Mo comes around and just basically throws up that weird, funky lob that Rudy just devoured all the time. Uh, yeah. That's just he's out of the box thinker, and uh, I'm sure that's one of the reasons Finch loves him is because he's it's a new thing, you know, something to play with. Uh, I actually. I'm pretty sure Kyle is the son of a coach, and I know TJ McConnell totally is too. Sense. And yeah. you can you can you can kind of see that. Uh, let's grab our let's grab our first break here. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Falling Knife Brewing Company, and we are excited uh, to announce a, another, hopefully a big uh, live show. The timing is going to be perfect. We're going to do it on April 19th at Falling Knife. The Wolves' first playoff game is going to be April 20th or 21st. We'll figure that out. Um, once the, the schedule is released, obviously, but you know, talking with the falling knife guys, we decided, you know, let's lock in the 19th. Maybe there'll be a play in game, um, play, yeah, play in game at, that'll be going on that night, too. So it'll be uh, me, Kyle, I had to remind Brit of it. So hopefully, Brit, you're still coming. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, uh, but uh, it'll be, it'll be fun. I think me, you, and Kyle did it about this time last year, too. Kyle's uh -huh. going to be in town. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be fun. And we really, um, I mean, we we want you all to be to be going to Falling Knife for the playoffs, but I think that's already going to happen. I mean, it was for playoff games. Uh, you know, Falling Knife was was packed last year, and in the spring they kind of get the TV truck out in the their parking lot. There, you kind of bring lawn chairs. Obviously, surprisingly can, good reception. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it's yeah, really cool. And I, I just think like it was, um, I think a lot of people had a ton of fun at falling knife for the Denver series, uh, last year. And again, some, some better weather to be able to watch outside and sit outside and, and do all that. In addition, uh, to, to the tap room where all the, uh, you know, the, the sound and TVs are on the wolves game too, but yeah, just kind of kicking off the playoffs, uh, with, with another, with another live show that'll be, I guess that's coming up. Was that about three weeks from now, which is crazy to me that the playoffs start in three weeks, but, uh, yeah, mark that down in your calendar, uh, April 19th. I will do the, the usual kind of be there to do sort of like a happy hour from six to seven while we're setting up. And then Britt, Kyle and I'll kind of go seven uh, to eight o'clock. And then I think if there is a playing game, I mean, I'll, I'll stay around to kind of watch that as well. So, uh, April 19th, we'll keep reminding you about that, but wanted to put that on your radar. And then also, you know, go to Falling Knife on Friday. Yeah. Uh, if you're you know trying to go somewhere to, to watch Wolves Nuggets. And then also just quickly, today's show is brought to you um, by Prize Picks uh, as well. PrizePicks.com, the Prize Picks app. Um, March Madness, that starts back up today, I think. Uh, you can look up individual uh, player props for that. You know, again, this is just like five bucks. It's, it's something fun uh, to be doing. Uh, while while the games are on, you can check it out for Wolves Nuggets. You know, I was looking it up. Like Jokic this season has five assists against the Wolves in two games. So I don't know if you want the prize picks. You know, look at what that uh, total is is listed at for for Friday. I was just started looking into some Denver stuff. It's crazy. He he also only had forty five assists in five playoff games against the Wolves last season. Was single digits in three of those five games. Um, well, that's more of a basketball topic uh, to to get into as to what the Wolves do against him there. But he um, didn't have an assist for three quarters, and Rudy wasn't playing. I know that was crazy. It was I remember we were yeah. sitting there, we're like, yeah. it was the fourth quarter, and he had his he had career zero. low. I'm not his season low was mm -hmm. three, and he had zero after well, three the, quarters. The season low, the the season low of three was the previous Wolves game in yeah. in November. Crazy. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um. So, anyways, price breaks up prizepicks.com or the prize picks app. And you can use promo code Dane uh, for a $100 sign up bonus. If you're throwing in some picks for uh yeah, for Friday's game against the nuggets. And 419 is the day before 420. So you can just get some gummies going or something. And, and falling knife, you they, know? they do have THC. Exactly. Seltzers there now. Yeah. yeah. Stock up, stock up. Um, Let's uh maybe talk about Jaden. A little bit. I think sure. that's that's been a real development since the Denver game, uh, as well as funny timing podcast wise. The day of that Nuggets game, Britain or Jason, I did a pod, and you know we were we were tough on Jaden. I mean, it had been an extended rough stretch offensively for him, uh, but he's he's shooting in the four games, forty eight percent last four games, forty eight percent from three, sixty eight percent from two, seventeen a game. I mean, along with the defense. Yeah, what stood out to you? Well, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I I'm still in prove it mode with Jaden. Uh, you know, I, the numbers over a three or four game sample are good. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they're sustainable. Uh I I think his defense on Cunningham last night was uh, sporadic at best. I don't think he's been as good a defender as he's been. Uh, I know the, you know, the word out of the wolves is constantly nothing but praise and, you know, patience. Uh, he's had his worst year as a pro, in my opinion, in terms of, yeah, in terms of where he should be. Uh, uh, I mean, he didn't really play like, yeah, no, he was, only he compared was, against last year. He was an eye opener his first year and his second year, ratified the first year and then last year was his blossoming and okay. this well, year, against, against expectations for sure yeah, yeah. that would be the yeah the delta of that wouldn't be wouldn't be good but i i do think Brett, that we're like and again like hand raised i i did the i did this the same thing and it just made me reflect on it a little bit more like the defense is still good and i think the defense just doesn't pop as much given that he's within a context of a significantly better defense so you're seeing other wing defenders defend almost as well as he does too with Nikhil and Kyle and, and I'm some of seeing that him lose his man more than he ever has before. That's just a flat out fact. Yeah. Okay. I just still, I think it's fair to say we're nitpicking if we're going at Jaden's defense. I don't think saying a wing stopper losing his man more than ever before is nitpicking. 
I'm just saying I think the defense is – you're right. I, I'm, I'm not saying it's been the best I've ever seen from him. I just think even with that, whatever that is, we're still getting good defense from Jaden. And, and yeah, not as good last night against Detroit. Um, this he, is the first season of his four seasons where the Wolves allow more points per possession with him on the floor than with him off the floor. It's the first time. And it's 5.6 as of three or four games ago, 5.6 more points hmm. per 100 possessions. I just think that um, he works hard. I don't want to say that he's not a dedicated defender, and I don't want to say he isn't incredibly capable. Uh, I think that he has cut his fouls some, and I think that he, in an effort to cut his fouls, has taken away some of the things he used to do extremely well. Um, I think his high-end defense is less high-end. Uh, and I think that he gets stopped on screens more than he used to. Some of that may be the way they want to defend. You know, maybe it's just you switch on the screen. Uh, mm. But I, you know, hey, I've been a huge Jaden McDaniels guy most of his career. Uh, and I just, you know, you got to call it as you see it. And yeah. Uh, what I see is somebody who um, is obviously a big part of the future. He signed a you know $130 million contract, 136 I guess, for five years. I mean, he's in the fold, uh, and I think he has. I mean, he's got a really reliable, you know, short mid-range game off the bounce, uh, he does defend well in the general, you know, I mean, relative to the NBA defenders in the world, he's still clearly top 25 percentile, 75th and up. Uh, but he's I, not. I think he's going to get all defense. Well, that I mean, would be, not, that would be not, a not shame. A that's, that's a reputation that that's, uh, you know, like a, a guy who stars in like, it wouldn't two, be a shame. Movies, that, that, it wouldn't people. be a shame. You don't need to be the best, best, best version I like of yourself. The best guys to be named the best guys when they are the best guys. So you don't so think Jaden McDaniels is a top ten defender in the league? Uh, I'd have to think about it, but uh, my first reaction is no. I mean, I think, I think we could make that a means list. less. That means a third of the teams don't have a wing stopper as good as Jaden. Yeah, I think that's true. Well, okay. I mean, and, uh, and also what I was going to say is also in the context of being the number one defense. And we would all say that Rudy is the primary driver of that. But what has also unlocked Rudy defensively this season is a trust and an, a, a trust in the perimeter defenders and a belief in their ability to pursue and chase and attack on the on the perimeter. And I, I think Jaden is does that as much as anybody on this team. I agree with what you just said. I think that one of the reasons that Rudy has a lot more trust is because of the upgrades, uh, which have been Conley over D'Lo has been Ant a little bit more attentive when he's on his game. Nikhil and over Jalen Noel, that sort of stuff. Yeah, Nikhil sure. and J-Mac and Nas are all, the in terms of defensive rating, they're the best on the team. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, this team is the best defense in the NBA because there is a hybrid system in place that allows all four guys, all five guys to be contributors in a manner that Rudy didn't allow in Utah as much. And I think that Finch has done a good job and all the players have done a good job. But I would not say the Wolves' growth from 10th last year to 1st this year has a lot to do with Jade McDaniels. I think he was better last year than he was this year. Um, I think that the surrounding cast plus Jaden is what convinced Rudy to be better, and I think that's made a big difference. Uh, I think it's possible that he could have had a better defensive season last year and still be deserving of all defense this year. Well, again, I, th I think what we're arguing about is um, I'm arguing from the perspective that I want the 10 best defenders to be named on the two teams. 
Uh, and I also like it to be as much as possible by position. Uh, and I thought that Jaden was just out of that ranking last year because he fouled too much yeah. and because he had a lot of injuries. I think this year he's not quite as good. And while defense in general has taken a uh, back seat, it's the most offensive year in NBA history. Uh, I do think that there are some really quality defenders out there. Uh, you know what Dylan Brooks has done in Houston, for example, and he hasn't played. Uh, don't say game. Dylan Brooks. I compared I compared Jaden to Dylan Brooks, and everyone got mad. <laughs> oh really? See, I don't listen to you. I don't listen to the podcast. I, mean, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> no, I, I, but I actually genuinely do share a lot of that because I think a lot of Dylan Brooks, like his perception is. He's not a fun watch, right? He doesn't seem like a fun personality. But what I was talking about is an all-defensive level perimeter defender that Dylan Brooks is. He was last year, has been previously, I think. Um, and then sporadic offensively. That's what I was going with. I yeah. think I, I, I chose or were choosing the the wrong name from a like a public, like, yeah, I agree with that standpoint. Yeah, but right. there is there is for sure a similarity there. And – the similarity I'm making is that I think Dylan Brooks this year is better at what he does than Jaden is at what he does. And, uh, you know, when it comes to offense, that's a whole other question. When it comes to a good locker room guy and personality, Dylan Brooks is like Pat Bev. If you have room for him and you need a lot of room for him, then he works. If you don't have room for him, then he's a disruptive force. Sure. I think he became disruptive in Memphis. I think there is room for him right now, at least in Houston. Just, and we can move on from Jaden, but statistically, uh, in terms of defensive estimated plus minus, he's 92nd percentile, 92nd percentile in the league this season. Last season, he was 92nd percentile in defense. And the season before that, he was 91st percentile in terms of defense. So from a statistical impact standpoint of defensive stats which are not perfect but i think this is the best one um they agree that he hasn't gotten better defensively but they would also push back on the idea that he's regressed okay uh, and this is my control. last pushback okay uh those things are predicated on what they think of the guy to begin with if you're playing with really good guys then that is weighted in there but I mean, you know what's also weighted in there is the on-off defensive impact that you stated was right. the worst without them. So he is – that's not a perfect stat either of saying the defensive rating is better with him off versus on. I mean, these are these are all Im imperfect. There's not – we're not going to find a defensive – a statistical proof for, no. for any of this. What stuff. I'm it's saying is – what I'm saying is, is that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If a guy is – thought to be playing with people who are not good defenders and the team plays well, sure. that guy gets as much credit or more credit as the bad defender who's gotten better. He's still yeah. kind of regarded an estimated plus minus, you know, it, it goes to, Oh, this guy is so good. He's even raised this guy up when in fact it could be right. the opposite. It could be the guy has raised himself up and therefore that guy is there. And I think that's actually the case with the wolves this year. Yeah, no, I, I I'm, at least half playing devil's advocate. Yeah, no, I it, know, and I don't. I, I mean, I'm. Uh, you kind of pushed me into being a, a Jade McDaniel's hater. No, it, right it now, is an which interesting not, topic. You know, it, yeah, it's an interesting. I, topic. I just, I want. Uh, I have praised him to high heaven most of his first three seasons, and have loved his game. Uh, I don't want to become complacent in my own attitudes toward sure. players. I mean, I, I want to, you know, I freely admit that I totally underestimated Nas Reed. Um, there's another side to that coin. You can be wrong overestimating as well as underestimating players. And if I thought that Jade McDaniels, if I was saying he deserves all NBA defense and is the wing stopper he's always been, in my opinion, I would be, complacent in my attitude to him and, and and overestimating him that's all let's uh let's for next week maybe like take some time and i mean you're watching as mm -hmm. much rest of the nba as as anybody is too and let's let's try and put together a list of what are all defensive okay team yeah, that sounds be. good i mean that's probably the way to actually i'm not 
what what I said was I think he will get it. I'm not saying I for sure would vote for it mm -hmm. um, because I need to look at, you know, I think it's been a good year defensively. There's like, I'm, my head's filling up with like 10 right now who are, who are in, in that tier as well. But let's, let's do that. Uh, let's do that for a, a future episode. Okay. Um, Nas Reed. Going to do, uh, do some Nas Reed. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's double, double with no turnovers last night. Yeah. That was in that you, you pointed that out to me at the game too of, I mean, what was he, one for eight from three? The, the yeah, three and wasn't. eight for ten from two. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just... that's, you know, like, it could be the, the reverse tomorrow. See, right. that's what's beautiful about Nas. Is well, that, what, what uh, he said to you was he's like, like, wait until I put them together. What, what he was saying <laughs> yeah. is he's like, I kind of, which is true in this non-cat time. Right. I mean, he's had a, I mean, he sh was shooting nearly 50% from three on like right. eight attempts a game. But it has kind of been a lot of like, oh, he, Nas went six for eight from three. And then I think literally in that last game against the Warriors, it was something like four of 11 from two or whatever. Yeah, yep, it yep. has been the inverse. I don't think at least off the top of my head that he's had a game where the two point game, the at the like basket he's 14 game, for 17 or something. Yeah. <laughs> right, which right, right, right. I mean, it's possible. It is possible. You know, what, uh, you know what I was and, thinking about, or, go, or you, you go ahead first. No, no. I, I, I think with my Nas thing, uh, he is much better defensively, but as I was talking to you last night, I just wish this team, well, and they can't afford to right now, I wish this team would realize that he is, if not a wing defender, and I would even go so far as to call him a wing defender, but at the very least, yeah, he is a high post defender. Uh, and well, this was a good take. We were talking about that last night. You're you were really concern you go are these nas of the five minutes gonna work should they be doing them and i was like well Britt, come on like who's gonna play back up like in this iteration right now without cat like he has to go but but you were like there's a better there's a right and wrong way to play nas of the five elaborate on that well i don't know tell me <laughs> well, well, you sure were, what i said it was well it was like where you position him with slow-mo Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I, I mean, what was. Uh, well, what I, I was saying is I think that uh, Nas is able to handle quicker players, you know, mm -hmm. the bangers, the people who back you down, you know, that is in his game. The fact that slow-mo is, you know, the, the, the guy that you resort to on that, that kind of makes sense. But in the playoffs, things are going to, you know, I mean, if if you're playing these games to get ready for the playoffs and you're playing Nas in the low block, um, that's just not going to work. And and I, I just think that they need to play a small ball. Oh, no, it was a small yeah, ball. That's we probably got you. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I kind of came around to it again. Yes. <laughs> what I basically said was, if you're going to put Nas out there as an effective defender, I think that you need to go small ball, really small ball, and make it be – he's either a small ball five. Put him out there, he, slow-mo, and three point guards. Yeah. And, and, and you know, have it be Iowa Ants type thing, you know, fly That's around. what it was. Play, play, if you're going to play him at the five – play him as a small ball five and so rather than they asking to, him to be a, a true five. So they like, can't I, put a true five against him because they'll run him off the court because you have other players. Everybody's on the go. And right. if everybody's on the go and, and you have one of those bullies banging Nas down, Nas will scorch him at the other end. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think, yeah, use Nas's quickness as a counterweight in matchups. So that if, you know, if Nas has to bang with Anthony Davis, that's not, you know, we saw what happened, you know. Um, and let's face it, the guy got himself into small forward shape to be <laughs> the player he is today. Yeah. I mean, that was a Herculean conditioning job that he, he wound up doing. He remade himself and, and, and made himself as an NBA player by doing that. So... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of Nas uh, after many years of 
being a real skeptic about him. And you constantly said, I like the way he worked on himself, you know, uh, came in as a chubby 264 pound guy on six, nine easily knocked off his feet. Um, and now, you know, he's crossover dribbling, reverse layupping people to death and, and not incidentally guarding threes and small fours very capably off the bounce. Very capably. When that was the thing, I mean, back then it was like, I will say, I think I was the highest at first on, on Nas Reed. I did yeah. not picture whatever I was high on or believed in. It didn't look like this by the imagery I had of it. Cause I never would have thought Nas Reed could be a capable defender. There were, there was zero. I thought there were zero signs of that in, in the first two years of his career. I thought there were signs that people were sleeping on of what he could do offensively the diversity of things he could do um offensively i thought that was untapped unrecognized and i think that's materialized but i've been thinking over these it's been three weeks now that carl's been out it's like if you would have could have told me two years ago or whatever nas reed's gonna move into a starting role and be a 20 a night guy mm -hmm. and then you said and i had to think about what that would look like how did he get his 20 i would have thought it would have been like zion like mm -hmm you know, four flat, put him at the top and he's isolating like that sort of what Giannis, you yeah. know, and in a, a bench version of that, uh, sure. um, that's just what I would have envisioned one because the, as you call it the shrug three, yeah, I, I didn't really think that that was probably ever going to be like a, I yeah, thought right. he was going to always be able to space the floor. I didn't think he was going right. to be like a 42% guy, but that's, that's what it's been way more than it has. We're starting to see more of the drive game, but it's like second side. It's from the slot. It's not really like they don't, which I would be kind of interested to see, like use him at the top and like run some inverted pick and roll and some of those sort of things. That's not what they're doing. But I think it's, it's all to say that there is maybe even more here. There's maybe right. even more in different ways um, to use him that if he, if this is this, over 40% from three is bankable. We're seeing more of the bag. Like I do think you can get the Nas three point shooting and the Nas at the basket, two point offense going there too. And some playmaking. I feel like we're seeing some playmaking too. I think there's, I really do think there's another level to the Nas read offense that could come. What I love about it. And what I know Finch loves about it is that, the defense has to be alert when they're when he's on the floor. I mean, if the defense uh, gives him any opening, he's got a really quick release from distance. If the defense, uh, you know, gives him space to get going, his handle and his speed off the dribble, he still has some problems bringing the ball up. But uh, you know, I I, I think that uh, he's just. He's got ability on quick decisions. He's a fast-paced player, I guess is what I'm saying, which is why he's – even when he was slow and chubby, he worked well with Jordan McLaughlin and J-Mac because they both are quick thinkers and they both play hoops a certain way. So, you know, yeah. I, I, I got to cut you off for a second, man. Yeah. What's up? The Wolves are no longer for sale. I mean, oh, you mean I'm, Mark Lori and uh, what, what's up? Glenn Taylor says the Wolves are no longer for sale. John said this John tweet says Glenn Taylor says Mark Lori and Alex Rodriguez's option to buy the final 40% of the Wolves links to make them the majority owners has expired. Quote, the Timberwolves are no longer for sale. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, I don't want to go too far into that because I got it. I, I didn't know this was coming or anything, uh -huh. but. Wow, this organization can't be normal. <laughs> I mean, that's well, I mean, so dumb. And we don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But like, what I, what? I think that's a shot across the bow. I think that look, Glenn Taylor is uh, enfeebled right now, and that's not a uh, uh, caustic comment. That's a that's a factual observation. He has, he's he's old. 
and he is uh, not going to own this team for another decade. And so, and the reason he wanted to sell it in the first place was because none of his family members wanted that. Now, maybe, uh, you know, all of a sudden the fact that they're good. The, the point I'm making is there's already been a substantial investment made by the minority partners who have that minority stake. And it's pretty big stake. Yeah. I mean, to think that A-Rod and Lori will not be able to at least have a huge say on who gets to own this franchise is, you know, these guys. Are I mean, gonna, I, I don't know, man. I don't know what's They're going not going to go right away. Now. They're not going to go away. Uh, you know, they're owning right now, you know, a huge portion of the team. Yeah, they own 40%. Well, <laughs> no way. No way. This didn't work. No way. Wow. Well, and, and I guess uh, people were saying, and I don't pay any attention to it, thank God, but uh, that Doogie kept predicting that, uh, you know, this, well, this Doogie sale was talking to Glenn, who was doing the whatever the words you just were using are to describe. I mean, Glenn was... Shots across the bow, whatever. Like, I mean, it was, I mean, Glenn on the record, on the audio of his voice was saying like he wasn't communicating with them and wasn't doing those sort of things. Everything I was getting was, you know, being, you know, they're navigating, they're figuring it out. Uh, it needs to be approved by the, the league. I don't know. What's, am I reading this incorrectly? <laughs> I, I don't know. The wolves are no longer for sale. I mean, so does that mean that uh, Lori and A-Rod basically cash out their 40% at a pretty big upgrade uh, and somebody else is left with the salary cap uh, shenanigans, huh? That doesn't sound like a terrible exit strategy for those guys. Here's Woj. Taylor says the window for Mark Lori and Alex Rodriguez to purchase the majority share of the Timberwolves links expired on March 27th and the buyer, quote, and and quote, the buyer could have been entitled to a limited extension. However, those circumstances did not occur. Woj says dramatic turn in Minnesota. <laughs> well, whatever. I, I, I okay. Now let's let's bring it back to reality for a minute, though. Okay, yeah, but, uh, this has absolutely no impact on what happens with the Minnesota Timberwolves on the court for the rest of this season. Good point. And, and that really no, is honestly, man. Most of my frustration is this has just been yeah. a, a really annoying thing for, <laughs> for literally for three years. I know for well, three see, years that's that it's been so difficult to get any like yeah. actual yeah. information on it because it's coming from different places. Yeah. Whatever. That's um, why you know I'm not a beat writer per se because I don't need to get engaged in that kind of bullshit. You know, yes. and so uh, I, and I'm know. sure plenty more reporting is yeah. There'll is be going more reporting, out, but. And, what listeners of this podcast and, and me personally, the attitude to have here is don't ignore good things just because bad things that have tangentially something to do with this down the road mm -hmm. are on the horizon now. The bottom line is the Timberwolves are uh, – did Denver win or lose last night? Lost. Okay, so they're a half a game out of the number one seed. Yeah, they're playing for the number one tomorrow. And so they are two games, two wins in the next 10 games away from the second best season in their his history, uh, eight games away from tying their best in their history, uh, and are going to be hosting a first-round playoff series and have a great coach, have a great Pobo who are on the same page, uh, all the things are in place. I'd rather have what they have right now than, you know, which are, by the way, have contracts that need to be honored no matter who yeah, the yeah, damn right. owner is. No, no, so, I, I, I think you're totally so right. If, if, if it's a season. bad owner on a great organization, fine. It's much better than a great owner with a shit organization. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's, let, it's, let the it's millionaires a let the billionaires play with their money. You know, at the end of the day, it'll matter when it comes down to salary cap decisions. But yeah. those those decisions are months away. Yeah, no, you're right. It's that it does is not going to impact the now. 
which is arguably the the now is arguably the best it's ever been in franchise history. Yes. So um, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, focus <laughs> on the good things. Yeah, no, I, I think not only that, but they also happen to be the right things this time. It isn't like I'm whistling past the graveyard, you know. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, just a little <laughs> little disappointed in myself. For... <laughs> Too, a little too much. Oh, uh, man. On my part. Yeah, you just, your, your priorities are off then. That's yeah, what I would say. That, that's probably true. Stay with a basketball, man. You know the game. You don't want to, you don't want to really have to be up to it. First of all, just talking to those guys over and over and over again will, will kill your brain cells. You know, just watch the game. <laughs> uh, well, we will we will see uh, what 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 happens there. I guess we got time for another fucking. Song. All right, I don't know. let's let it roll. What uh what else? Well, I mean, let's talk about Nah. You wanted to talk about Nah last night, and I think he's been uh, Nikhil, an, yeah. an example of you know why the organization is so healthy in terms of the parts that matter. The people who coach the team, the people who view talent the people who scout, the people who uh, develop the talent once they're on the, on the, on the team. Nah has been taken from a cast off with a bad Utah team into being, I would say uh, in the seven man rotation um, pretty solidly. And the Wolves last I looked, have like a like a one thirty defensive, I mean offensive uh, rating over the past eight or nine games. Uh, he's been fantastic. He's been hitting threes. He's constantly moving. He Best offensive Ru- rating on the team since Cat has yeah. been out. Well, I guess and Monte it, Morris is it like one thirty three or something? Nikhil, it was something no, absurd. One nineteen four. Oh, okay. It must have gone down. Are we talking time. about Nikhil Alexander Walker right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That. That's right. I didn't know if you said. Sometimes you get Nas and not, no, no, not no, N A W, no. Yeah. And and I think that uh, in my opinion, the two guys who always show up are Rudy Gobert and Nikhil Alexander yes, that's Walker. A, yep. Mm-hmm. The guys who just don't ever mail in a game or need to take a game to uh, collect themselves within the game. You know, mm-hmm. Ant is probably the most notorious in terms of taking some plays off. Then again, you know, the, the, the caveat always is, uh, you know, when you have that kind of ceiling, uh, sometimes maybe you need to do something to, you know, your makeup creates that. I don't know. I'll give him a pass because he's a phenomenal player. But what is great is when you have a couple of regulators and you have a regulator off the bench and you have a regulator in the starting unit and Rudy Gobert and Nikhil Alexander Walker uh, don't take plays off. I respect the hell out of that. Yeah, I, I really do. And just like watching it and even, I mean, and there was a lot of people who gave Rudy in particular praise for this last night, Finch and Kyle Anderson right. talking about it too. And it, or we were just sitting there. It's like, yeah, he's wonderful they, at that. They, they weren't, trying against the Pistons last night. No, they weren't for the first they, three three quarters. Or Rudy, so. was. Rudy yeah, was. Rudy was. And Nikhil, when he got on the floor, was because yeah. there's a consistency to to that. And, you know, and I, I, I mean, I don't want to excuse that behavior completely from Ant, but it's like it, it doesn't bother me that Ant has bad games or some of his games, you know, the he doesn't have the juice all the way turned up. What's disappointing to me about it is that it's predictable. It's going to be against the Pistons. It was going to be against the Hornets, you know, mm-hmm. like you, you can come. Sometimes to it's going to be in the afternoon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, there's a predictability to the inconsistencies of Anthony Edwards when that happens. It hopefully goes away as he gets older and more mature. I mean, Rudy Gobert's nine years older than him. Um, but I think one of Rudy's most commendable, traits is is his consistency and commitment to winning you know right. regardless Absolutely. of it he there is he has a he gets the concept that a win against the pistons counts as much as a win against the nuggets and the standings i guess that that's totally true there's tiebreakers and stuff like that but he appreciates the value uh, of a win and also just i think rudy hates to lose 
Mm-hmm. I think Rudy hates to lose. And I um, also think he has suffered enough abuse about the fact that he's not a kind of player that can fill out the platter, get the ring, you know, be the guy. Uh, he can be played off the floor is the biggest cliche. Uh, his teams are great regular season teams, so on and so forth. I think, you know, he's on a mission for that. And he's been taking names, you know, throughout the NBA of, of people, you know, you can tell, you know, Draymond, for example, and other mm-hmm. guys, but anyway, just people who uh, he feels disrespect him, you know, he, he, he keeps it and it fuels him. And uh, I, I think it's pretty obvious last night that he was a stalwart early in the game and Nah, I mean, Nah hit some big threes once again. Um, he's been really good at knowing when to get to the corner and getting the outlet. He's, uh, you know, he's just also, I mean, slow-mo did this, just this incredible uh, wending his way through like four or five players and then putting like this reverse lane, but he was almost, uh, you know, he was so close to the baseline underneath the hoop that he had to reach out to bank it off the backboard. That's great. And he, you know, and he pursed his lips to say, Ooh, you yeah, know, uh, that's right in front and, of us. and then Nah was right there. And all of a sudden Nah starts going on that robot dance because that's the way slow-mo looked. And slow-mo <laughs> started to do the robot dance with him. I mean, it's just, that's the kind of thing, you know, there are sometimes with the wolves, especially like with this pointing thing, where you say, you know, you're 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 in your face of your opposition. You're kind of trash talking, and sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. The wolves haven't won enough, in my opinion, yet to be the trash talkers yet. But I do think that if you're having fun with your teammate on something your teammate just did. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, even if it's at the expense of the other team. Yeah. But if it is, it's like it's kind of making fun of slow mo's unique style, too. I mean, you know, and, you know, it was like a robot euro he was doing there. (laughs) Exactly. And so, and and whenever he makes a mistake, some you could just see stamps his foot and stares at the sky. I mean, he he's a gnaw is the kind of player that wears his game, you know, on the outside. And, uh, if he's not doing well, it'll show. If he is doing well, he's got the three-point thing down now because it's becoming a theme. He's hitting so many of them that everybody notices that he looks at the bench and gives the three fingers. And you know, he's been he's been really good. And I said to you last night, and I really believe this, I think he's ready for a really good postseason. I think that uh, yeah. yeah, no, 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 oh, uh, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Well, maybe both of them. Maybe I mean I. You're concerned I get, about the Kyle. I'm, well, I'm concerned about the fact that uh, he's got weaknesses that um, are, are over and over scouting or yeah. repetitious play can uncover. I don't see. I mean, Nas' weaknesses are purely physical. I mean, sometimes. You know, yeah, you might, you might be like, able what to could go, go wrong. What, you what might would be able really... to goad him into getting in foul trouble. I mean, he plays really tight. Yeah, but uh, he's only going to play twenty minutes a night in the playoffs. You know, like the, I, I'm, I'm with you that as a playoff player, Nikhil is a really he's gonna high be a floor. floor. Like, yeah. but like, I don't. What could happen in the playoffs that would be like, oh, Nikhil had a bad playoffs because I. Feel right. very confident in the consistency of the effort. I feel right. very confident in his ability to navigate screens, defend, and all this stuff. It's like, you know, in a in a first round playoff series, could he shoot eighteen percent from three? I yeah, guess. If he loses he's confidence, been... he's a confident shooter. Yeah. But I think that he has such a track record lately that True. it's going to take like three games for him to yeah. lose his confidence. Yeah. You know, I I just really I feel good about him going in, and I feel you know I'm feeling better about this team, although. Just quickly, I know where you know you got to get to Denver, and uh, no, we're good. And, but uh, I think that as as much I did a mailbag the other day, and it'll be out today. And a lot of the questions were, you know, the classic. I mean, five years ago, the questions were the same, like you know, polarity about cat. You know, good cat, bad cat. There's always so much am- ammunition on both sides that that debate 
just constantly rages. But the Wolves have become much worse at the foul line, both in terms of the frequency of getting there and the accuracy when they do, uh, and their shots at the rim are down. Um, Their offensive rating, despite some really great aesthetic-looking stuff, is the same as it was when Cat was there. Um, It isn't like the team has gotten better because Cat is out. It hasn't gotten as bad as you might expect from a max player being out. And so that argument still holds. But the argument that they're better off without Cat is just not accurate. No. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what I've just been – I've been thinking of it like less so of how they – I've been trying to move myself into how they played when Cat was there and how they're playing with, with how, when Cat isn't there and thinking about what of these things from those two – things can mesh together that's how a much, good way to think of it how yes. much can that because yeah because the ceiling of this team is found in the answer to that yes. you know and and if, it is, and if it even comes to pass i mean sure. one of the things i will say is i want to cool the jets on cat being back for the first round for example yeah uh i would much rather see him get ready get in shape and be ready for a second round series if it comes to pass hmm. than rush back have the excuse of rushing back particularly if it's in the middle of a series that could be and needing to sure. you know how cat is i mean he wants to immediately make an impact uh when he came back last time and finch got him the last shot and he hit free throws and i mean it was a it was a thing and uh cat comes and goes in the playoffs traditionally. He's had bad games and good games, uh, mm-hmm. but he's not as reliable a playoff performer as Ant is, for example. Right. Um, and so it's a gamble. If you bring him back uh, in the middle of a series and he's trying to prove himself too much and this team is used to playing without him now and he comes in, I just don't like the noise factor that yeah. happens even if he is ready, and I'm not sure he will be ready, you know, on torn meniscus is, you know. Right. Well, and you, you started it by saying this team is better with cat. Yeah. A, a, like a, and, a healthy cat. Yes. Yes, exactly. A, a, a healthy cat. So that's a, you know, that's, you're not talking out of both sides of your mouth by saying, oh, I maybe don't want him to come back for the first round of the playoffs. No, you're right. saying you want him to be back in a way that doesn't disorient that in a way that, you know, he is healthier and, can be relied upon to do certain things. Yeah. My context is the best possible outcome for the Timberwolves. And in my opinion, the best possible outcome for the Timberwolves, assuming that when he gets reevaluated after four weeks, which is June 9th, which is five days before the end of the regular season, April 9th, April April 9th, sorry, uh, that it would be a period of another week or two adjusting. And then you're in the middle of the playoffs I don't know. You know, that begins to get, I would love to see him. If indeed there can be a second round practicing out, working with the team uh, and being ready, being activated for the second round. Yeah. I think, excuse me. I think we're gonna get the chance to talk to cat next week. Uh And, you know, just that's kind of how it goes. And B did the same thing once he was out. It's three right. or four weeks or something like that. Then he'll talk to the media. So I think we are maybe a week away from. I'm not. I don't think that's going to necessarily give some give clarity on what the situation is. But right now we are just in the most abyss possible of what like the most vague injury update you can get is somebody will be re-evalu- reevaluated at X. And that's, I'm not, that's not a, just a Timberwolves thing. It's no, with a, a lot of Brandon Ingram that's going on with the Pelicans too. Absolutely. Like, so it's not, he's coming back. Then it, what that means is it, it opens up a timeline after that, that could be. It's a, a pivot point. Times. It's a, yes. it's a point where you say, all right. Uh, it's kind of like you give a weather forecast. Well, you right. usually give the weather forecast at the beginning of the day, you yeah, know, right, I mean, uh, right. th- this day is this. If you yeah. give that the previous day, you don't really have an accurate forecast. Right. So right. Uh, the time to get more clarity on the ex- severity and uh, progress of cat's injury and surgery is 
after four weeks after that surgery. And mm -hmm. to for anybody expecting that within a week after that, he's going to be on the court playing NBA basketball, In the playoffs, uh, yeah. I would say that's dubious at best. Yeah, I mean, well, I that's generally where my mind goes with it too, but I don't know what the injury is. I don't know. Like, right. that is has not been – a you know a, a clear thing so you know we'll see the good thing is is this is an interesting team right now without him looks pretty firmly like a team that would be a top three seed in the west top four you know whatever they're going to be a top three seed yeah. in the west i don't yeah. i mean unless new orleans doesn't lose and the wolves go into a swoon because the clippers aren't winning out you yeah, know? yeah yeah i was more saying in like the general I don't know if it was this group for the whole season. That's probably not true because you just lose some depth or whatever. But they can they can hold the Wolves can are showing that they can hold their own at the level with which they were at for this somewhat short period of time that that cats out. So I don't know. I'm I'm getting into like learning this version of this team and and coming out pretty pretty pleased with. Yeah, with they. I running. mean, when it matters, they turned it on against Cleveland. I thought that was an excellent game, and yep. that Golden State game was just a gut check that they passed sure. uh, and then Detroit. Yeah. They played like shit for three quarters, but that's what they, you know, that's what some great teams do. They conserve their energy and yeah, it's frustrating when you're watching it because you never know. And, and this team last year's uh, pock marks of terrible uh, defeats. And this would have been a costly defeat because OKC and Denver both lost last night. Right. So, so this instead was, a chance to gain ground and they gain ground and uh here we go they took care of business unlike mark glory alex rodriguez and glenn Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> great segue oh, well, we will we'll talk about that later i do i'm going to say this though what happened to get the alex rod this is glenn taylor's fault glenn taylor was working with the rain company the rain group to get a new owner for the team back in 2020 they were not getting they did not find an ownership group to take it over that quickly or as quick as glenn wanted to keep in mind a global pandemic was going on and everyone almost everyone on earth was holding tighter onto their pennies you know like and, and right. weren't really trying to buy 1.5 billion dollar things glenn was frustrated with that took over the process of purchase of the finding somebody to buy the team ends up finding Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez to be that, that people. There was not a outside source that the company they were working with, the rain group did not find Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez. He let the rain group go, took over the process himself, chose Mark Laurie, Alex Rodriguez, lasagna, hamburgers, signing a piece of paper in Mankato. That all happened on Glenn's volition. I think he thought it was going to be something. It wasn't, we'll, we'll see, but, that's where this all started. And I mm -hmm. think that is um, in, an important variable that I know. Um, it's been three years of other stuff since taking your shoes off and A-Rod and Tolosa and all this other these other things that have happened. We'll go through all of that. I'm sure John will do an excellent job um, of, of covering that as well, Woj and National. I mean, everybody's all over it. I think what's interesting right now is just looking at my phone as people are talking about it. There's no source material coming out from this. This was a Wolves press release in yeah. which the national media people are glamming on and just quoting out. So there isn't, as of right now, at 10 a.m. On, on Thursday morning, there is not uh, additional reporting on the situation. So I'm hoping for something peaceful. <laughs> I'm hoping there's there's something normal uh, to, to come out of this. It's unfortunate. Um, but like you said, the season's going to continue to roll on. And I'm going to go to Denver. And, 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 you know, I mean, the poet Gary Snyder uh, once commented on, on society saying, you know, you don't have to be in the path of this. You can just take a small step to the left and watch the whole thing go flying by. And uh, the Timberwolves are here. They have a great organization. They obviously have a very confused ownership situation. Uh, it may impact the team next year and in years to come if tight pockets uh, are required uh, because this is not a tight budget. I mean, this is a tight budget now. Uh, but Ugh. let's watch the whole machinery go by. And uh, when the time comes, 
sure. you know, let 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 the uh, the billionaires sort it out. It's their their plaything anyway, and it has nothing to do with me or us, as far as I'm concerned. Sure. Yes, and the the basketball is good. We'll keep we'll keep focusing on that. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, someday, someday. <laughs> He's Mitt Robson. Um, the the mailbag is up, or probably I don't know if it's up at the moment right now. Yeah, but it'll, it'll be... be up by the time uh, this this podcast airs. I yes. certainly would hope. Yes, yes. And and by the way, if you're subscribing to the N one, especially with the mailbag, I mean, I, I assume I don't know if my editors included it all, but there's almost as much content, original content in the mailbag as there is on the site because you know I want to answer people's questions and I get carried away. So. Essentially, if you want all of my writing, uh, I've worked it out now with MinPost. You know, they had a space limit for a while, and this N1 is great. They get to issue a newsletter, yeah, and, and it, I get it, to write longer. It, it pops up that the N1 to subscribe to it, which is free. Like, yeah, it, just put it, it yeah, in your absolutely it's no a cost, newsletter. Right. It's a there newsletter. There is no but, paywall, right. But just go to one of Britt's articles that he's, you know, he's writing a weekly, at least weekly column. And if you're on one of those, um, you can just put your email address in to get the and one, which is just additional content from Britt, who credit to him, you know, is wanting to write more about this team and, you know, a, a, a and very interesting can. season. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so check that out. Uh, that will be up sometime here. Uh, well, probably up as you're listening to this on Thursday. Uh, Britt, this uh, this was fun, um, and I'm really looking forward to the to game against the Nuggets, and 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 really like talking to those guys in Denver. Yeah, um, no, I think it's going to be great. You love to do this. Yep. Denver is one of your favorite locations sure. because of the guys you talk to. Mm-hmm. You love that team. You like yeah. your hotel will not be available, but uh... I know I'm so sad. <laughs> right next to the stadium, yeah, there's an Avs game yeah. that I can't stay there, but I'll. Well, we'll we'll figure it out. Uh, so that episode with uh, with those guys will be up, I think, um, sometime later later this evening. And then uh, Kyle and I will talk on Saturday morning after uh, Wolves Nuggets. Uh, so that will be what we have for you uh, this weekend. Until then, he's Britt. Follow my Twitter at Britt Robson. Read him at minpost m i n n p o s t dot com. You'll be able to find his his mailbag up there. I'm Dane at Dane Moore MBA. Uh, until later tonight with the DNVR guys. He's Britt. I'm Dane. Peace out. How I'm feeling, man, I hope it never stops, yeah. Green and hot so you can find me in the crowd, yeah, yeah. Don't let standards ever, ever bring you down, yeah.